Let's go, Kaguya-sama, back for season four. And already, right back into the sexual magazines. Hey, look at this dude. Look at these dudes. Like where this is going. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it drive you crazy? He's not wrong. How you feel about this depends on <laughs> which side of it you're on. <laughs> Yes, what was it? Let's find out. What's the aftermath? Oh no, is she gonna lord it over everyone? <laughs> oh no, this humble brag. I get it, she's excited. And now suggesting she's an expert. She has one kiss. Alright, I'm listening, Kaguya. Even though I've already seen this part, I'm still confused by what, what went wrong. I gotta go back to the last video and <laughs> read comments to refresh myself. Seven months ago, hot damn. Okay, so it was the tongue part, but honestly, no harm, no foul. I'm sure Miyuki just hated it. Wow, I, I, like it's been so long. I have so many questions going into this this short, very short four part season. What does their day to day relationship look like? Because the, you know, you can have that big confession and things can seem really great and you have that initial boost of excitement and endorphins. Can that transition into a sustainable day to day relationship where they're really comfortable? We got a little shot of that in the last episode of the last season. They were side by side. They seemed pretty comfortable. I think that was kind of my biggest risk for them as a romantic pairing. And then, of course, the logistics of are, are we actually going to Stanford? What does daddy think? And then some unresolved issues for me about Miyuki, which I think were fairly controversial when I talked about them in season three. It's very very clear to me that he loves Kaguya and he, he really likes who she is. There's like a little part of it that also is about validation for him, I feel, that's wrapped up in class and financial status that I think bears some risks. We'll see. Feels good to be back at least. And new opening. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, they're all little dolls. That's cute. Feels like coming home, man. There are also so many like smaller subplots that are kind of hanging. Loose threads, mini romances and the like. Christmas is an airship? I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Was that like the red carpet ramen event? She gets the headliner. Yeah, but speaking of subplots, we gotta find out the destiny of the, the kings of ramen. And everyone clapped at the end. Love is show, that's what they were saying. Love is show? What does that mean? Love is show. Love is show, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I guess we'll find out. I mean, if it means love is showing your love through action, I think Miyuki's been there and back after the, you know, the series season three finale. What more can you want? <laughs> but nothing will ever be the same. That's how it is. That's how it is. This is so exciting. This is so exciting. Because yeah, this is all the beginning, right? Everything we've seen is just to start the relationship. And that's where a lot of the work begins. Same Miyuki. Same Miyuki seven months later. <laughs> Ara Ara is back. Oh. You know there's something to that. There's something to that. Kawai so. Hey. <laughs> and it's like we're back in season one. <laughs> oh, Kaguya-sama. Never change. She's very dainty, yes. You look a little smaller than usual. Save some from Yuki, damn. Yuki's kiss turned into a chibi. It's fine. They both enjoyed it. The end. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> That's what makes it extra special. Whoa, whoa, hold on. <laughs> hold on a second there. Let's slow that down. She's pushing this again. This is almost as bad as the time she forced Miyuki into bed with her. The jury's still out on Kashiwagi. Big doubt. <laughs> yep, that's how that goes sometimes. 
Oh, no, that's exactly what I was worried about. Not to harp on this again, but this is exactly the issue with confessions in general. It's like, it goes best when it's like a smooth transition. You know, there's like a very gradual incline. Miyuki's gesture was so far ahead of where they were in terms of their general rapport on a daily basis, you know, almost as if it was forced by some kind of deadline, like going to college or a season finale. They had that super romantic moment and a change of status, perhaps, but the comfort still isn't quite there. That's so deliciously high school. I had a high school girlfriend where the relationship was basically mediated between mutual friends. We barely ever spoke. If we spoke, it was for two minutes and then we would both talk to our friends for hours about that two minute interaction. In one of those short conversations, we decided to be a couple. I think it was like a week before summer vacation. And then we we dated for, for two months over the summer, but didn't even meet once. I mean, this, they're not that bad. It's something like that. <laughs> That's why she's sleep deprived, yeah. And hence we get little Kaguya, Kaguya chan. I don't know, I feel like sleep deprivation makes me more pleasant. She's on that sleep deprivation high where she's just blissed out. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. Chica? Your best friend? Chica just keeps getting slandered. First the finale where she couldn't solve the most simple case. And now this. Oh yeah, a lot of people don't like Chica, right? Think she's conniving. I mean, it could be a lot worse. She could be fully cognizant and it be awkward. This had a lot of potential for disaster. I don't know, this feels good. Whatever. You know, they're comfortably interacting. Conversation's overrated. It's overrated. You know what's really bizarre about watching this again? So, I, like, I paused the video in the beginning and I went back and watched my reaction to the finale of season three. I don't remember how much I talked about this during the series, but I was in the middle of a really passionate relationship watching Kaguya-sama, which I think gave me a lot of the things I had to say about the show. In fact, the, the end screen for that episode is my ex-girlfriend's dog, which is kind of bizarre to see. That was one of the, the craziest years of my life. I have yet to tell that story in full, but it's a pretty bizarre one. But one interesting aspect of that and why I bring it up now is for the first like month or two of that relationship, we couldn't speak at all. We couldn't communicate because she didn't speak English and my Korean was not great. One thing that was surprising to me is how little it mattered. You know, you need like kind of a basic level, but you know, if you'd asked me before that experience, I would have told you that I really value or need someone who I can communicate with at a certain level of depth because I'm someone who likes to talk about ideas and stuff but it really didn't matter like there was something else something extra maybe something subconscious that just took over I was like super in love and that's it it's it's kind of weird in general you know like everybody has a list of things we're looking for in a partner a lot of times the things you list out are not actually the things that work or the things that end up hooking you and I think part of that is because a lot of attraction is not at that conscious realm it's deeper I mean if I'm really in love with someone like Miyuki is with Kaguya I don't care what IQ we're, we're talking at I'm just happy to be in that person's presence <laughs> Oh, this looks good. This is like the best, the, the best part, the best interaction they've had. Good on Miyuki for matching her wavelength. Good to see Miko too. No. And love is love, damn it. That's a, oh, that's a big deadline. A lot of pressure, yeah, for kids. Hey, hey, hooking it up. <laughs> she just has a radar for people having fun. Maybe she's jealous. Hmm, I wonder. Thin line. Thin line between love and hate. She's paying attention. I mean, speaking of the interaction, you know, they, they feel really comfortable. Hmm, <laughs> we got ourselves a little bit of a triangle. <gasps> Damn, Ishigawa. Well, well, let's not jump to conclusions. She might come over. Oh, so much for playing it cool. <laughs> Didn't even let her finish her sentence. Speaking of sex, what kind of. What is she into? <laughs> I have the same thought. Oh, that's not as fun. Miko took that really far. Oh yeah, she's a closet pervert, right? Whoops. Miko just exposed herself. Well, that's... Disappointing for, for our boy. But, you know, she invited him to her party. That's cool. 
Damn, look at this dude, all of a sudden. Ooh, how do you choose? Look who's popular. Little does she know. She got me just like... It's so hot right now. Does <laughs> this make them rivals? Tsubame versus Chika. Yeah, Tsubame made that accidental confession to the whole school. She's, she's riled up. We got a whole different war going on. It's a different love war. Hmm. Ooh, how do you take this if you're Tsubame? Because she, I mean, she obviously knows. Yeah, yeah. Right, they had that whole conversation. I don't know if this is what she's doing, but I feel like in that situation, what, what might occur is Tsubame would invite Miku, you know, almost because she has to, but there's like a little bit of a test in there. I think it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people to be like as strategic as some of the characters in the show are. Sometimes you know what would be optimal, but you leave avenues. You know, you you purposely create competition to kind of see how things go. Does that make sense? Like if I meet a girl for the first time and things are kind of in the early stages and it's not clear what's going on or if there's mutual interest or attraction, there are situations where competitors emerge, let's say, and it's kind of tough because you don't want to be possessive prematurely. On some level, you're like dying to like grab the person, you know, and eliminate competition in a sense, but also to observe and see what happens without putting any constraints. And like, then you hope that you end up getting chosen, but you also fear the, the results. Don't know if that's what's going on, but I feel like that's a potential for this whole love triangle thing happening. Honestly, I think it's Ishigami's game or it's his to lose. The fact that Tsubame is having this dilemma and even thinking about it at all means he's kind of in, you know, in a sense it's there. Cause she's already kind of accepted him. She already has some interest in him. If he were to pursue, show sincerity and not make any large goofs, this is like a thing, a real thing that could happen if he's committed. Speaking of mistakes, Though, on the flip side of what I just said about giving people space, sometimes as the person being observed, you want to go out just to show that you have other options or demonstrate that you have other things, which I think backfires if there's interest like this. And Ishigami doesn't seem like he's that adept at handling the situation. So there's like a large chance he's going to trip up with Tsubame because of Miku Ino. But that also might be something he wants. Long story short, it's a very rich minefield. The heart. I don't think Ishigami realizes the situation he's in. I don't think he realizes, like, how much he's already done. Yeah, she's hurt. Speaking of minefield. God bless. <laughs> Death. <laughs> Death for you. For a French kiss. Why was that gibberish scene one of their best moments? And it's kind of important because we might be going to Stanford. That's the decision we have to make. Right, this is the big hurdle. And it's not just words, it's not just the statements, it's the whole vibe of the thing. There are logistical issues to contend with. But more importantly, you gotta sort out the thing with Miyuki first before you base your whole life around him. I mean, this is pointless for Kaguya, for the show, because this is the whole premise. But man, do they overthink things. I think if you're Miyuki, or Kaguya, for that matter, you just, like, make a date, you know? Make a date for Christmas Eve, see what happens. Let things take their natural course. Reveal the path through action. Yeah, if Kaguya's good at one thing, it's talking openly and honestly about her feelings. No more than a greeting. How do you greet people if you don't stick your tongue in their mouth? Tell your, yourself, Kaguya. Tell yourselves. Yeah, she's fine. Everything's great. She's very healthy. No, no conflict there. I mean, it's natural to have doubts, though. Oh, here we go. Her IQ is back. Huh? Why is everything freezing? Why 
Why is that so sinister? And an ending directly related to the different selves. This is a very somber, somber ending. Can you catch the plane chair? Or is it going to leave without you? It's a big decision to make. And Thanos, just disintegration. It's making me a little bit sad, but not in a bad way. It's interesting that how much this show connects, resonates with my memories. It's very like contextual to a time and place for me. And like very similar experiences. Huh. I'm really happy because that episode addressed a lot of the things that I was wondering about as the, the last season ended. Because just because there's a grand confession and a great moment doesn't mean their problems are solved. But it looks like the ice Kaguya that we know has taken over. It could mean we go back to cold calculating Kaguya. Or it could be a necessary stage of growth where that Kaguya integrates with the other Kaguyas and she learns how to express herself. All those pieces are her. They're just kind of fragmented because she's in a chaotic state based on what's happened. It's really amazing for me coming back to this show. It's seven months later since the finale of season three and a lot has changed. I relate a lot to Kaguya about the decision to follow Miki to America because the relationship I, I mentioned earlier, that was a result of me having three dates in New York and then deciding to move to Jeju Island in Korea in the hopes that I could pursue that relationship. I mean, it was kind of a crazy thing to do. Pretty much everyone I talked to advised me against it, and it wasn't a logistically good decision, and it ended in absolute carnage and flames. Nevertheless, the way I feel about it, and the way I feel about Kaguya's dilemma, is that sometimes there's no bargaining with these things, and there's no real sense trying to think it through logistically. Nothing against that, you know, that it could be done that way. For me, there's just some moments I know I have to follow. And if I feel that way, there's more at stake than the outcome. It means there's something critical. You know, these things aren't accidental. It's not disconnected from my life or from who I am or from what I need when I have that kind of fate arrow or like fate gravity pulling me in a certain direction. It means there's something critical for me there to experience based on who I am at that moment. Probably means there's something I need to learn. It doesn't mean it's essential for my life. You know, if I had not gone to Jeju, would I have suffered? Probably not. Nevertheless, I feel like there were rewards to following it through. There were rewards to following that passion. It came in the form of growth and learning through experience. It revealed to me a lot of things. It revealed to me weaknesses I had. It revealed to me dangers for myself. It all also revealed to me who I want to want to be, qualities I want to embody. And I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, I think on some level, the, the pull, that pull that I was describing, is on some level an instinct, even if it can't be fully understood in the initial stages, that there's something critical for you. So as cliche as it sounds, I think Kaguya should follow her heart. Whatever that means, you know, her heart might lead her into staying. But if she really wants it, and I suspect she does, the obstacles can be overcome. You know, her father not approving can be overcome. The issue of getting into Stanford or not can be overcome. And I greatly understand her trepidation about the whole thing because it contains severe danger for her. The more she lets herself slip into this relationship and be honest about her feelings with herself, and with Miyuki, the more danger she's in of getting her heart broken and, you know, exposing herself, being vulnerable, having it end in tragedy. The good news is, I think, even that might not be such a bad thing if you zoom out and look at the big picture. Because at the end of the day, while this is about their relationship, you know, it is about Miyuki and Kaguya together, it's also very much about the two of them individually and their growth. And there's something about Miyuki for Kaguya that is essential for her growth. We've seen her, we've watched her transform throughout the series. And the same is true for Miyuki. There's something about Kaguya that is essential for his growth. That's part of what makes the romance convincing and compelling. A lot of times, relationships in media don't work or are not interesting because it's like character A, character B, plot demands love, right? Like just by virtue of plot, they're together. Kaguya and Miyuki are so much more because their relationship is a vehicle and is critical for their own self-growth and development. So we only got three more episodes of this season, I guess we'd call it. Can't wait to see what they do with the remaining episodes.